Today's topic was suggested to us by Pope. If you would like to suggest future episode ideas or topics that you would like us to talk about, leave a comment down below. You can also email us or message us on Twitter. Links will be in the description below. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Planeswalkers Pub. I'm your host, Aaron. I'm Eric. Howdy, it's RJ. Today we are going to be talking about where to start. If you're new to magic, what do you do? What are some tips and tricks you might need in order to succeed in your magic career? But first, let's talk about our signature card. Yes, every episode of the Players Rockers Pub will feature a signature card that may or may not relate to the episode's topic. But first, make sure to hit the actual like button and subscribe. This way you stay up to date on all the newest episodes. And follow our Twitter. Today's signature card is Soul Conduit. Soul Conduit is an artifact that costs 6 mana, pay 6, tap, 2 target players, exchange life totals. So this card might seem like it's jank, it's kind of just a giant mana, it's Sink. not going to work. It's yeah. 12 mana to exchange your life total with someone else. But let me tell you, from a person that actually had his life total switched... Uh -huh. <laughs> From uh, 86, From 86 to, eight. to 8, this works. One thing to note is the ruling of the actual card itself. By switching the life totals, that is technically classified as loss of life. Yeah, loss of life and life gain. So if you have something that says, whenever I you gain a life, get a thing, you would get however much the difference would be, so 72. Which begs the question, if someone actually had like Sanguine Bond on the field when he used this, they would have just gained that much life too. Yes. <laughs> They would. Yep. And the same thing is true for loss of life. So uh, Grevin, if he lost the life, would have been powered up like crazy. Okay. Yeah. One thing which is very important to know about this is that, because even Eric mentioned it at the game, it doesn't sacrifice itself after it does it. Yeah, I thought it did. No. It you... does it. <laughs> the card does not say anywhere on it, sacrifice it. So if you have like an unwinding clock or a zebra muse, you can basically mess around people's life totals. For days. Instant speed. Someone's at like 12 life and someone swings with an 18 18. Just swap it with someone else. Yeah. Make them make their life total higher. Or, or just kill reverse. Them. You know, just like, okay, well, I'm at like, you know, 40 life or whatever. Who cares? Like, you know, I'll just take that five damage or whatever. Cool. Switch. You don't have four life. You die. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's great. A lot of people will, will probably say, like, you know, oh, well, this is going to be too slow. Or if you draw early or some that sense. In Commander, we have a tendency of just having a lot of lands arbitrarily. I don't think ramping up to six is that crazy. Because he legit no. cast this and activated it the same turn. Yeah. So oh, he would. It was it was crazy. Of course, um, the problem with that idea is twelve mana is like expropriate mana. It's omniscience mana. Yeah. If you're holding up that kind of mana to do amazing, astonishing, crazy game-winning effects. Those are the kind of cards you want to be playing, not this. Uh, we can put on screen Planner Bridge, which costs, I think, eight. Costs to six to cast. You pay eight and tap it. You look through your library for a permanent and put it into play. Yeah. Okay. In which case, that is legitimately a strictly better version of this. Two more mana, and you just get a permanent. Yeah. You get Two. a Platinum Angel. You can you get, could get this. You could get this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then not have the mana to activate it. Yeah. Someone says, uh, like, hey, just choose one. I'm taking Planet Bridge over this. Like, this doesn't stop infect counters or commander damage. So even if you switch life totals and you have, like, 86 life, you can still be killed with infect or commander damage. Yeah. Switching over to our actual main topic, which is basically talking about things that we wish people had told us or things to just mention to newer players just starting out. You could be just starting out with just commander in general or even just magic as a whole. I think we need to start, like you said, very beginning. I just heard of Magic the Gathering. So wh how, how do I get into this? Well, you start well, off on the right course by coming to the Planeswalkers pub. Yeah, <laughs> we'll learn you how to play magic. Oh. Well, uh, the first bit of advice I have is probably controversial considering our channel. It's Probably not to start with EDH. Yes. We are a non-standard format. And even though we are arguably the most popular one, it is extremely complex. Even explaining how commander damage works is complicated. So my first bit of advice is to start with standard. Yeah. yeah you'll I mean... learn the basics of magic. You'll have a much shallower card pool. Because even though there's still hundreds of cards in standard, how many of them are actually useful? At most, 200 cards. 
probably more actually since Thurman. Well, it's came way out. more because yeah, Thurman, every set has at least 200, 200 cards. cards. So. Let's say at max, Santa has 500 cards that are useful and stuff like that. Commander has over like 2,000 cards. Uh, no, sir. Commander thousands. has literally every card ever printed in Magic the Gathering. Over 10,000. So Tens of thousands of it's cards. better to kind of start off smaller than actually jumping into this legitimate freaking shark tank of things. Honestly, <laughs> if you're really like, if you can find people who are willing to play Brawl, I would probably start with Brawl over Commander. This, this It has the same yeah. benefits of standard, smaller card pool, Yeah, and you still get the flavor of having a, a singleton yeah. format with a, with a Commander. Mm -hmm. We know what format we should start in. Where am I getting all these cards from? Well, you're getting them from pre-cons. Whether that mm -hmm. be the Planeswalker decks in standard, the Brawl Precons, oh. or the Commander Precons for Commander. Mm -hmm. Pre-constructed decks are definitely the way to go to get you on the road to playing any of the formats of your choice. It is also nice to note, if you do decide to say, well, I don't want to do Standard or anything like that, sense, or let's say that you do know how to play a little bit of Magic, and you do just want to jump into Commander, the Commander Precons are basically the best way to start, because it gives you an already built deck that works with giant quotation marks. It functions as a Magic the Gathering deck. A bit of sarcasm aside <laughs> from the experienced players laughing now, the, the Commander decks actually are getting better. Yeah. I think we all can agree that these Precons this year are probably the best they have released. Oh. Well, when most people They're definitely Paris, stronger. <laughs> Edgar Markov. We're not the talking Earth about Dragon. Edgar. We're yeah. not talking about that. That was that whole Vimoplasm. set. Vimoplasm. That Atraxa. whole set was a trap. Uh, the power levels are something, but the thing about a Commander Precon is it comes with 100 cards. It comes with a full deck that you can play, and from there, you can branch off. You can add stuff to it. I think, really, one of the first products, if you're just trying to build a deck from scratch, would probably be a fat pack. Yeah. You get 10 boosters, which you may or may not get some interesting stuff from, but you also get a pack of 100 basic lands. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, you can get those really anywhere, but you get 100 right there. You get 20 of each color. You can start a deck from there. Never underestimate just getting a fat pack. Especially when you're brand new, you have no cards. So the main objective for the most part is, well, getting cards. I personally believe in actually just buying packs, not so much individually, but if you can get like four or five, like in a draft, like in a booster or something like that, that could be nice. Also to see if your local game store, LGS, actually has a draft deck or something in that sense. Or even like if someone fired off a draft and they don't have anything else. What we basically consider as draft chaff is basically like commons and uncommons that are just not useful in that particular draft game. Typically people leave them in the card shop just to mm -hmm. give to anyone. Yeah. Ask the owners, be like, hey, is there any draft chaff or is there any actual cards or whatever that someone just left and they don't want? Can I have them? Typically people are gonna say fine because they're common. Or they won't even be around to ask because they just they left don't them. care. Yeah. But always ask before picking up yeah. a stack of cards because they could potentially be some ones. Oh, yeah. RJ can easily mention Seven Dwarves. I like Seven Dwarves. It's a common. It's a common. It gets pumped by itself. And I think it's just a goofy card, so I want as many as I can get. I have 15 of them right now, and I'm still collecting. Yeah, and the cool thing is, it's a card that everyone basically just says, Oh, here you go, it's garbage. Here you go, it's garbage. We're eventually going to get 100 cards worth enough to make it into a Seven Dwarves deck. Mm -hmm. Even though it's, it's going to be illegal because you can't have It's going to be 100% illegal, seven. illegal, but the point is with Commander, we it's play for fun more than anything rest. else. Yeah. It's going to be basic land mountains and Seven Dwarves. I, mean, I would, I would, I would, I would yes. toss... Seven Dwarves as the Commander? Yes. I would He's toss the like boss a um, Blood Moon in there, but that's just me. So uh, once you've bought these Precons <laughs> or these seven. Fat Packs or Draft Chaff from uh, the unsuspecting tables, uh... What do you do with all these piles of cards? Well, you do research. EDH Rec, uh, the Command Zone, Commander's Quarters. Scryfall. Scryfall. Us, for the most part. All these YouTube channels or websites or places are just an area for you to get knowledge on how to build your decks. Um, what he's basically referring to is what we consider as net decking. Net decking. Mm -hmm. Which is fine if you know what you're looking for. My recommendation, use EDH Rec. Um, like, scratch that. It's fine if you don't know what you're looking for. If, well, no, if, if you know what you're looking for, then why are you net decking? Because you're like, exactly. okay, well, how much... I mean, if you're looking for an archetype, it's like, oh, if I'm looking for <laughs> cards that tax my opponents for something, then okay, then I guess you'd look that up. But if you have no idea what you're doing, you look, you net deck so you know what you're doing. Yeah. The best way to learn about cards is to read about cards, to read about what decks those cards go in. I'm going to you... counter that statement by saying... Oh, this is on the stack. Ugh. 
Storm count two. Counter that statement by stating the fact of, yes, you can net deck or stuff like that. However, that is a, albeit tedious, option i do also actually recommend as opposed to net decking physically talking to people talk to the shop owners talk to either the people that are actually at the store itself and just asking them hey net decking unplugged yes pretty much trading cards don't assume that just because you have all the newest stuff or like you know like throne of eldraine just came out don't assume just because you only have throne of eldraine no one's gonna want anything from you in fact that is the opposite people love new cards yeah like, I t- today, there's a bunch of people coming up to me. Yeah, they were probably standard plays. But like, hey, you got anything from Eldraine? It's like, no, man, sorry, not really. All my stuff's old. If you have new cards, people want them. And you can get, like, old cards for new cards. It's one of those things that you can potentially open up something that someone else never got to see. Yeah. Which is great. And that means that you can then trade for them for something that you need or want. Don't always just trade for stuff that you need. Trade for some stuff that you want. Yeah, yeah, but make sure you have an app. Make sure I have your smartphone with you and you look the cards up online for the values. At oh, yeah. TCGplayer.com, for instance. Or Card Kingdom. I actually recommend looking up TCG Player more than Card Kingdom just because Card Kingdom tends to skew their prices slightly. Mm-hmm. Plus, TCG Player actually has an app that you can download, which will then just scan it. It'll put its price on the screen. This way you kind of know. You yeah. typically want to keep the trades as even as humanly possible, money-wise. Don't be like me when I first started thinking, okay, well, one card for one card. We're good, right? Yeah, that's fine. They're just paper. <laughs> yeah. One piece of cardboard for another piece of cardboard. We're good, right? Turns out the answer is no. Don't feel discouraged by just asking them, like, you know, hey, is this more expensive or something in that sense? Just because they've got more cards or you're like, they say, oh, well, what are you looking for? You say, I don't know. Ask them. Let's take Eric, for instance. Yep. Okay, I go up to Eric, and, I'm, and I say, hey, I'm looking for a card that... I need something that can tap for mana that's not a land. Okay, uh, how about uh, Soul Ring, or Mind Stone, or Thran Dynamo? But that's, our good, that's a decent example right there. And the fact of, you just said a general question, and he gave you three different options. So at that point, you can kind of say, oh, well, Mind Stone, you mentioned. Well, what is that? Well, it's a two-mana artifact that taps for a colorless, or you can pay one and tap it and sacrifice it to draw a card. So then you think, okay, well, tell me about card draw. I'm in mono red. What's some good card draw? Fifth is looting. Cathartic reunion. Tormenting oh, no, voice. But that's my point of saying trade versus net decking, because net decking, you're, yes, you might know roughly what you're looking for, but there's always better options out there. That's one reason why mm-hmm. I love it. And there's uh, cheap there's cheaper That's options. not true at all. Because your net decking tells you the better options. So, but here's the thing, is those are also the more, most affordable options. Yeah, if I'm know. looking up great green decks for ramp, great green sources for ramp, you know what it's going to tell me? Oracle of Voldaya. Zendikar Resurgence. Zendikar yeah. Resurgence and um, Marari, Exploration. Wait. Those are incredible land ramp cards, but they are a lot of them are expensive. Yeah. Well, there's a solution to that, actually. Uh, you could use proxies. That is, that's something that you have to discuss with your playgroup, though. Mm-hmm. You can't just show up with a deck of 100 pieces of printer paper and say, hey, guys, let's play some EDH. You got to be like, hey, guys, I also don't do an entire deck of proxies. Yes. Yeah. Magic the Gathering is an expensive hobby. So using a couple proxies here and there is okay. Yeah. But I wouldn't proxy the most expensive card in existence. Like, if you know you will never own this card, don't proxy it. Don't proxy your entire deck, but maybe have a proxy of Oracle of Maldaya. Oh, yeah. I'd say that's fine. I'm just saying, like, don't proxy a, a Scrubland or a Bayou. Yeah. Or, Gaia's Cradle. There are the Gaia's Cradles. There are alternatives that are more affordable. More like affordable. the Shocklands. The Painlands. The Shocklands. Painlands. Let's put Gaia's Cradle up there real quick. It's roughly around like $300 or so. Prices on screen. <sighs> Let's put up on screen Growing Rights of Iklamok. And they'll put up the price on that. Clearly, there's a discrepancy in prices. Yeah. yeah. But when Growing Rights flips over, yes, you technically have to have four creatures on the battlefield, but when it flips over, it becomes basically a Gaia's Cradle. It and here's the thing, though. Arguably even better than Gaia's Cradle. Because it can because... tap by itself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Because you already have the four creatures out. You can technically turn one Gaia's Cradle and do nothing. Don't assume that just because it costs more, that it is better. Yeah. In order to get, like, you know, they might be able to drop the Gaia's Cradle or whatever. If you drop your Growing Rights... 
at the same time you drop the guy's cradle, you're basically gonna have the same amount of mana by the time yours flips over because they can't do guy's cradle unless it has four creatures basically anyway. Plus, growing rights actually get you a creature, yeah, which helps fuel it. your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I love about magic, if someone brings you a question of how are you going to stop this, there is an answer that exists in magic. Oh, yeah. I promise you there is. And the answer is counterspell. It is yeah. always counterspell, but outside of that... So that's printed a lot. It's not or that expensive. A or a fluster store. Great card. Um, fluster store like $20. Yeah, that's because it's I was going to say, when, modern. <laughs> when it comes to some stuff isn't always better than others, take Maze of Ith. $20 land, tap it yeah. to... Remove a remove creature from, from combat, combat and you don't take any damage from it. Or even, there actually is a maze that is in... Well, was in standard. It's from... Um, it's something... It's the Compass. The Matic Compass. The Matic Compass, yes. It takes like three turns for it to flip over, but once it flips over, it is basically the same principle as a maze of it. That's and it taps for mana. Maze and it taps for mana. It doesn't tap for mana. <laughs> Which is great. The Compass actually... Tutors for a land, if I'm right. It does tutor for a yeah, land. Yeah, it tutors for a base. It tutors uh, for a triggers. land and then eventually flips over once you have like seven or more lands on the field. That's just good. So don't assume it just because they spend more money on it, it's better. Yeah. So we mentioned not to make your entire deck of proxies. Mm -hmm. I do also want to mention that my friends had a idea. If you're going to make a proxy for a card, be able to purchase that card within the next two months. Because that's a general enough time to get your, your allowance. Or a part-time job. Or a part-time job or whatever you do to be able to buy it. So we mentioned Guy's Cradle. That's a $3 freaking card. Don't proxy that even though it's very very good and you're thinking oh well no one's going to care or they won't mind or anything in that sense people kind of do only because it becomes an arms race and that means that you decide to print off something like you know that you think isn't that big a deal whatever i'll grab it like you know whatever that's fine and then someone else prints out something stronger someone else prints out something stronger at that point you're basically all just playing with fake decks that's yeah, not yeah. playing magic yeah well some people do i mean like i said proxies were getting are getting more and more popular in edh and some play groups just print out proxy decks and play them against each other. But that's a kitchen table thing. Yes. That's a play group thing. Obviously, yes. if you walk strong to an LGS with what should be a couple thousand dollar deck that's all just printer paper, they're not going to be happy. Yeah. No. My thing that I always say, and will always continue to say, is I'm fine with copies, not so much proxies. Copies basically say, if you buy the one demonic tutor for $30, you're a kid or something like that, since, or you're just an adult that doesn't feel like spending $30 for like five of your decks. Yeah. I'm fine with making a copy, a photocopy of that once or twice. Because at that point, I'm not spending $30 for each one individual one. Yeah. Um, Soul Ring. Don't make copies of Soul Ring. Just buy another one. They're like... Two dollars. Yeah, they're like. Since his divine top is another one, that's like it's like thirty dollars. That's something I'm fine with making copies of because I do own the one. I can always produce it. One thing I always say, tell people as well, is when making copies, because someone will, if someone questions you about it, especially when it comes to a copy, you can say, hey, give me two seconds. It's in my other deck. I can just pull it right out. And if you are lucky enough to own a real, actual copy of Guy's Cradle, then of course you can make a copy, proxy copy of it. Yeah. Why spend four hundred dollars more than once on the right. same card? When it comes to stuff like that, like guys, if you physically own a guy's cradle or like you own a limited edition Ugin or something in that sense, people are usually fine with you proxying or copying those because those are really expensive cards that you shouldn't be playing with. Now we have our cards. We got our cards together. Now what am I supposed to do with them? How do I build a deck? So I'd say the those biggest some issue really good paint. when it comes to deck building, which I definitely suffered from. Don't doubt removal. I my First commander deck probably had, because it was a pre-con and I changed things around, probably had about two or three pieces of removal. Yep. Just targeted removal. That is not enough. Yeah. You need to interact with the board more. You can't just expect to build up your own board state and win. Other people are going to remove your stuff. Yeah. You need to do the same. There are problematic artifacts. Enchantments. You need to get rid of them. Green and white are good at this. Yeah. Do you know how many green and white decks I've played that just can't remove a powerful artifact or enchantment on the board? Probably a lot. you. Probably a lot. one of mine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, naturalize and disenchant are reprinted to hell and back. They're 10 yeah. cent cards. Yeah. And they're cheap mana-wise. They're both like two mana. They're worth spots in your deck, even though they're not Oracle of Maldaya, yeah. which is a $30 like awesome card that does so much when it comes out. Naturalize is just, oh, destroy artifact or enchantment. So is disenchant. It's utility. You need utility. It's not flashy. It's not expensive. You don't feel 
like you're on top of the world when you cast these cards, but they get the job done. And one thing I do want to mention as well, especially when it comes to Commander, don't assume that you have to be the police of the entire table. For instance, yes, you should have removal in your deck, possibly about three targeted removals and maybe like two board wipes. But you don't necessarily need to stop everything someone's doing. Bring also, those like numbers that. are really low. Only two board wipes? I'd do like four or five. That is a lot. For what? What the fuck? No, it's not. No, it's not. Because my goad deck has like four, I think. It does not. Yes, it does. Four isn't it's a bad not. number yes, to it have. Yes, it does. That's, that's... God, Day of Judgment, uh, Planar Cleansing. I don't have Planar Cleansing in there. I need No, to. you don't. <laughs> Two is basically fine, because at that point you're just killing your own self. I don't have a third reason. one at least. Yeah, and the reason you well, need how many that many board wipes is for when people do mass amounts of Anymore. creatures. Yeah, but the point is you only need, if everyone has two in their deck, that's basically eight total for the game. Yeah. If you need to board wipe eight freaking times, to... clearly you're not killing that person fast enough. <laughs> Unless, you're, unless you have your, <laughs> half your deck in your hand and the other person's gained two life a turn, chances are you're not going to get to those board wipes because two cards in 99 eight it seems ain't like good a lot. Odds. I don't want to be drawing. I don't want to be drawing the you're... third board wipe with no bloody creatures in the field. The point is, you're not the only one actually playing this game itself. So just because you think, oh, that thing he just dropped is a real problem, someone else is also thinking that too. Talk to the other people at the table saying, hey, that may or may not be a problem. What's everyone think about it. Just Another problem that people can have with deck building is count your lands. There's arguments over how many lands you should have in your deck. 35, 40, 41. There's that. There's the max number of lands, but that's not really what I'm talking about. When I am building a deck, I count up all the mana symbols of each color, separate them out, and then based off of that percentage of what it is in the deck, I'll count that many basic lands out. And that's how I'll do my lands with the colors. Because like with my knight's deck, I didn't do that at first. I split it 50, I split it evenly. Deck did not function. <laughs> Lord Wingrace, th his biggest issue was I never made enough green mana to do anything. Took out a bunch of, of two-colored lands and put in basic forests. The deck functioned perfectly. You have to make sure that your lands tap for what you need. Mm -hmm. You don't just need an even split. Because like I, every deck I played when I first started was an even 50-50 split on my colors. Because I'm like, oh, well, what if I need this color and I have this in hand? If you have an even split and you have an 80-20 color split of your non yeah. you're going to be screwed. Yeah. The best way of... Well, the way I basically kind of recommend it is, for starters, when it comes to new commanders or something like that, if possible, choose a monocolored commander. This way you don't have to worry about the land situation yeah. as much. Mm -hmm. But let's take someone like, you know, Tessa Karloff. Why not? She is technically two colors, so you're going to need both colors in order to actually cast her. Typically, what I always... Just building a new deck or anything in that sense, I always just default put, say, put in 40 lands. But after I'd mark out 40 lands, it's like 60 or technically 59 cards, minus your commander, um, of other stuff, and then look back and say, okay, can I move these land, this land count down? Because mm -hmm. the worst thing in the world, everyone can agree, is getting flooded, just drawing land by oh, lands. Oh, yeah. It is, yeah even the in the worst. lands matter deck, it is still the worst. Oh, yeah. So I, that's kind of my theory. Just put in 40 from the gates and then slowly whittle those down. However, don't go under 35. <laughs> Yeah, that's generally mm -hmm. at that point you're gonna get screwed. Although of course this does depend on the deck, how much actual card yeah. draw that you're gonna have, how much actual ramp that you're gonna have. Which we're going to eventually make a full how to build a deck 101. The amount of lands depends on how much ramp you have, how much card draw, how much artifacts you have. Also, the type of lands you have can vary dramatically. You mentioned basics. Well, what if you have rainbow lands like Seed of Brass or Mana Confluence? Those tap for any color. Or dual lands. Dual lands as in cards that tap for two colors, not dual lands yeah. as in the OG dual lands. Yes. Well, this, is gonna, this might sound stupid or silly, but I usually keep a 50-50 split on all those. Like, the, the check lands doesn't enter tapped unless you have X or Y. I have one of each combination in my deck yeah. because that'll give me the color that I really need at the time and something else. Yeah. yeah. When it comes to basically putting together your first deck... Don't be afraid to use the tap lands, but try to limit as many tap lands as you have. Because mm -hmm. it, the worst thing, another thing is pretty bad, having a tap land that comes in taps when you really need that mana right now. The best tap lands are the sky lands, the temples. You definitely, if you need to have a tap land, those would be the ones I would use. I would also use the ones that gain you life because, and that's another thing too, if a land comes in tapped, Make sure it does something for coming in tapped. For newer players, I always recommend monocolored or two colors max. 
And well, then not even with colors. Slowly pick, go. An, pick an easier archetype. Don't immediately run aristocrat. Don't immediately go for combo uh, infinite combos because yeah. those are a bit more complicated. They have to you have to work into it. I like beatdown decks in general. That's just my my style. But also you could start with burn decks or something like that. Something where it's just like I do X causes X to make me I do X thing causes damage to make me win. And for those of you that are confused with all the terminology we just use, aristocrats basically means that you're slowly draining the table and taxing them for doing things. Burn decks is basically just using spells to slowly make people's left toes go down. Uh, Beatdown, which is basically just hitting people with creatures and turning creatures sideways for the most part. And yes, I agree with literally all of that. Mm -hmm. I also agree I with agree the, well. the easiest archetype is tribal. Yeah. But yeah. Period. Elves, Tri goblins, merfolk. Oh the my. decks just, practically build themselves. Yeah. The decks literally just build themselves. It's they, the easiest, pretty much I feel like everyone can agree simultaneously is that the easiest thing to run in Commander is mono green tribal. Yeah. Not, Elves, yeah. Because Elves. you have the best ramp and you've got just tribals you don't really have to think. And you got card draw. Oh, naturally. hang on. Mono green tribal, that's not Hydras. I want to point that out. Because <laughs> Hydra tribal, I'm, I'm. Hydras are complex. That's a complex the, thing. The exit mechanics and cheapening Does he still spells. Have that and... Yeah. I just so, run it. Because it's, I need to fix it. So let's say, in which case, that you're brand new to Magic. You just learned how to play, something in that sense. Your friends are playing Commander. Ask them to just borrow one of their decks. It's already pre built for the most part, they know that it already works. Yeah, uh, don't. Uh, they know that they mostly me. already. Your decks work. Mm, they work sometimes. They sometimes work. <laughs> they function. <laughs> but the point is, they're better than just buying nothing and then just sitting there not doing anything. Yeah. Always another thing too, which I'm pretty sure these guys can also agree on. The best way of learning how to play Magic is to just play Magic. Yeah. Oh yeah. L typically, winning teaches you nothing, but losing teaches you a lot of cool stuff. For instance. Why did I lose there? How did I lose there? What is that cool combo that he just did? Or what decisions could I have made differently? Just by playing Magic all the time. You're like, oh, well, I don't feel like, you know, playing this game or I'll sit at this game or something like that. Even if you're sitting out the game, watch the game. And also do another thing as well. Ask questions. Ask literally yeah. all the time, what does that do? That is the most question thing in all of Magic. Don't what it do? What it do? What does that do? Oh, hey, yeah. what's that card? Ask the question. Don't assume anything. That's one thing I do want to mention. I mean, yes, people say all the time, oh, well, reading the card explains the card. Ask people what it does. Rob has been playing for years. Even he asks, oh, what does that do? Read it for two seconds. Oh, that's cool. Eric asks all the time, what does that do? And then regrets. <laughs> You do this really and then instantly regret, yeah. <laughs> you do this really fun thing, too, because you're just like, oh, what does that do? Reads it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I love that noise. Because it's like a turtle, it's like, just like curling back up real quick. It's, 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 it's like, oh, I guess we're gonna die now. Like, it's, it's the greatest thing in the world. Like, <laughs> but those are actually some of the things that we want to mention to newer players. But now it's time to actually jump over to our favorite stuff, which we like to call Last Call. Last Call. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So if I have thoughts to the actual people listening, please leave a comment down below if we miss anything. Only because this way, when newer players actually run run into this episode, they can look down in the comments and actually see things that we might have missed. We want to thank Pope for giving us a suggestion for this episode, as well as letting you all know to jump onto our actual Twitter if you have a suggestion for an episode we should do next or later on down the road, let us know. As well as thanking all of our actual subscribers for- Thank you guys. Subscribing. For Thanks. <laughs> Thanks guys, see you next time. See you next time.